Hello everybody and welcome to the first episode of Owen's Thoughts On and in today's episode we're going to be looking at Dragon Quest XI's Definitive Edition for Nintendo Switch. Uh, yeah, a little bit of a mouthful there, but yes, this is the Definitive Edition of Dragon Quest XI released back in 2018 for all the consoles. It's now finally been re-released for Nintendo Switch. So I've been having a bit of a play of it and uh, I'm going to tell you my thoughts on it, whether or not I liked it, whether or not I disliked it, what I liked, what I didn't like. Just a general sort of review of the game, whether or not you should pick it up. But uh, yeah, without any more further ado, I think we should get right Dragon into Quest XI is not only a mouthful, but one of the freshest games I've ever played to date. With its fully voiced, interesting characters, or 80 plus hour captivating story, Dragon Quest XI had me hooked like no other game before it. The game itself began development in 2013. Yeah, that's right, 2013, and the game only launched in September of 2019 for Nintendo Switch. This game had a development time that is only shared amongst games such as The Legend of Zelda or mainline Mario games. Square Enix took their time with this release and it shows. The game itself was announced in 2015 for PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch and even Nintendo 3DS, with the 3DS version being scaled back in many ways and including a slightly different art style and even new developers working on it. Square Enix developed the PS4 and Switch versions with the studio Toy Logic giving a hand on the 3DS versions. This was one of the first games announced for Nintendo Switch and it was announced during the days of the Switch being known as the NX. Yeah, looking back on it, it was a very, very long time ago now. Both games have the exact same story and it's going to be hard for me to talk about both of these without going into major spoilers of the game, but I'll give it my best shot. The game takes place in Edgeia. You play as the main protagonist, which you can name yourself similar to other JRPGs such as Pokemon. Pokemon is a theme I'm going to bring up a lot in this review, as I feel like you can really compare both of these games. And no, that's not because they're both just JRPGs. Wake up in your hometown of Dundragil, where your mother informs you that you are the Luminary, and this is the only person in the land that can destroy the darkness, bringing hope to everyone else in the rest of the land. Having learnt this, our hero then goes out on a quest to find the king and inform him of the good news. You then find the king, who takes a nasty turn and labels you the Darkspawn and is out to kill you. You then play the rest of the game out as you are running away from the king, where you find an amazing group of like-minded individuals, these being Eric, Serena, Veronica, Solvando, Jade and Rab, who are all willing to help you, as you are the Luminary and it is in their interest to help you as you can stop any threat of darkness across the land. As the story then progresses, you are told to go to Eggdrizzle, to visit the World Tree, and yes, that is famous to the Super Smash Bros Ultimate stage. However, there is a slight issue on getting to Eggdrizzle. You have to collect 8 different orbs in order to get there, and this does feel similar to other JRPGs or such as Pokemon or even Link's Awakening in the fact that you have to collect 8 different things to get to a certain area at the end of the game. As we all know, Pokemon does this through the use of gyms or trials, and Link's Awakening has done this in the fact that it uses instruments to get to the Windfish. This is very similar in the fact of we're going out as a team collecting 8 different things. Again, it might not be instruments, it might not be gym badges, but this time it's orbs, which will then lead us to Eggdrizzle. You might think I'm being really vague here, but that's because I don't want to spoil any of the plots that happen within the game's story. As even though I've just explained the game, it has many, many plot twists. As yes, we are on a quest for eight different things, but for example, in Pokemon, we're going down to a different town. In Dragon Quest, we're going to different areas of the world, all with different unique locations, and it all feels different from the last. What I've just described to you might sound vague, and some could say it's sort of the overarching story of the entire game, but trust me when I say there's lots of other little stories, and this all adds together to create the massive and amazing lore of Dragon Quest itself. And that's not to underestimate some of the stories that you'll get through the lore of the game. For example, there's one story about halfway through with a mermaid and the relationship that they have, and it's very, very sad. It is truly one of the saddest moments I've ever witnessed in a video game. Or some of those subplots could take you to a town where you have to help a king win a horse race. The game is very, very different, and I think it does this to fully showcase the world around you. My point is here that Square didn't need to add a horse racing section here, but they still did. They didn't need to add an entire subplot of a mermaid and their relationship and what happens with that. If this was another developer such as Game Freak or Nintendo, whatever the case may be, they'd have you go to another town or maybe explain a little bit of a story through cutscenes. Dragon Quest actually takes you there. Square Enix have taken you to this location for you to literally witness what's going on in the world around you. And some could say that's filler, but it really does help to bring everything together and make it feel like a massive long quest. I believe that this has really helped me get interested into Dragon Quest, as I've played games similar such as Xenoblade Chronicles, and it really didn't grab me. Dragon Quest has grabbed me as a, as a player because it's giving me new information all the time. I'm learning something new about this big open world all the time. And yes, we do have one quite simple objective. There's so many little mini objectives within the game itself to keep the player occupied, and every time you boot up the game, you believe and find out something new. 
If you're wanting a game with story, trust me, Dragon Quest is a place to go to get it. And trust me, please do not underestimate what I've just said. The story is probably the biggest part of Dragon Quest. And yes, I know I have been very, very vague with the story in this review, but if I really went into detail, this review would be hours long, but it would also just ruin the main part of the game. This has to be witnessed. If I tell you it, it's going to ruin the part of the game and a big part of the shock with it. Some fans might be put off by this is Dragon Quest XI and that they haven't witnessed the other games before it or maybe put off or by the number and just maybe feel a bit scared by that. Please don't because the game includes past words. These are little things that you collect throughout the gameplay of Dragon Quest which you can go into a separate menu and read up on the lore and read up about things you've missed within other titles. Speaking of other titles, these are referenced in the 2D mode of the game. Yes, this game features an entirely different mode which kind of is its own game within itself. It is amazing that they've been able to do this and put two games into one. This game actually goes cheaper than some full price games as well, so you really are getting your value here. You're getting a 2D retro style game, which are becoming more popular, especially on the eShop, and a full, big, semi-open world JRPG. Because of this, Square have really appealed to two target audience here. They've appealed to the people that like retro games, especially on the Switch with the eShop and the Switch Online. But they've also appealed to more modern people that enjoy the big open world games. And the fact that both of these are on one Switch cartridge is really impressive by Square. Also impressive by Square is the visuals of the game. This runs on Unreal Engine 4 and runs beautifully. I haven't really noticed any frame rate drops. The game does run at 30fps which is similar to the PlayStation 4 counterpart. But again, if a PlayStation 4 game is running at 30fps, it's definitely going to run better on Switch. I have no complaints though in terms of frame rate and visuals here. Anyway, the game does take a slight hit is in the resolution. On the PlayStation 4 it runs at 1080p and however that has been downscaled to about 900p docked, 720p undocked. However, that's not really anything against the Switch because the Switch itself only has a 720p screen. Nothing's really being lost here. Dare I say it, I think the game looks better undocked. Potentially due to the pixels on the Switch's screen being smaller than that of a TV. But either or, no matter where you play this game, it looks beautiful. And yes, frame rate is consistent throughout. No matter if you're running around or maybe in a battle, handheld or docked, the game is always at 30. Always. And that really shows the care that Square really put in here. This game was designed for PlayStation 4 and Switch, not a PlayStation 4 game that they've downscaled to put on Switch, which we really need to see more developers doing. We need to see more developers thinking about Switch in additional development, not just thinking, we can get this game running on PlayStation, Xbox or PC and then see if they can downscale it. Square have really cared about Switch here as much as they've cared about PlayStation. They're appealing to as many people as possible and that's great. The only place where the Switch just take a little bit of a hit is in the lighting effects and in the anti-aliasing, especially of the grass. Again, I'm not complaining, it's a minor nitpick and the fact that the game runs smooth is better than anything else. I'm just glad that this game is on Switch and the fact that they've only had to downscale the graphs and the lighting really, really shows this. The game also shows its quality in the amount of cutscenes. Seriously, when you're playing through the story, there's a cutscene almost every five minutes. There's also a, a beautiful CG cutscene in the beginning of the game as you boot it up, which is kind of similar to Smash Bros in a way, which I really, really like. As soon as you hit press on the, on the load game, it just boots up into this amazing CG five minute musical and it is such similar to Smash Bros and it's, it's really really beautiful. In terms of core gameplay this game is a turn based JRPG and it is very very unique in the sense of it's so fresh in 2020. Outside of Pokemon what can we really say in the year 2020 as a turn based RPG apart from indie games? What is big budget? What big budget developers are really going for this turn based RPG? Even Final Fantasy by Square has sort of moved away from that. This game is huge in the sense of it is so fresh because it is so old and it plays like a 90s game which hey that might be weird for me to say as I wasn't born during that era but looking at games from this era and from games from that era and comparing it, taking away the visuals and especially as you seen in the 2D mode it does really feel like a 90s game. That being a game that was on the snares or Mega Drive or you know whatever the case may be, it feels that sort of quality and because everything's on one cartridge and because everything's done, there's no microtransactions, it really does feel that way. If the internet shut down tomorrow, this game would feel like as complete as something like Final Fantasy on the NES or SNES or whatever you want to say. It is very, very full and very retro in that sense. 
Speaking of being fresh, the game is still turn based and that makes it feel fresh in itself. However, this time they are also the pep power, which is kind of like a final smash where you can get two characters together, they'll work together and there'll be a little cutscene and a very, very powerful attack. It's very, very fun, very, very unique and does make the player really feel good when it happens. You need two characters to at least do this and when you get all four of them, it all just wipes out enemies. It's amazing. And the fact that that's running on Switch too, the amount of effects that's going on, are beautiful, amazing. Also amazing in the gameplay is the core main boss fights. As you're going around the game, there's obviously going to be a lot of boss fights. You need to get orbs and whatnot. One of them I really liked, for example, is the one of the first ones with the octopus, which were really nice. There's this one where you take over the um, this like layer of time, and you go in, and you defeat all the dragons. It's very, very fun and very, very satisfying to beat these massive, big enemies and finally kill them. But what's interesting about this game is, there's a lot of boss fights, there's a lot of fights in general, but the game never feels hard, or it never feels too easy. And Square Enix have done this in a way of that they have skill trees and level up systems within each character, which really tailor make the character to you. For example, let's say I'm taking on the first octopus boss fight. If I want this to be a challenge for me, I can run straight into that boss fight at a lower level, let's say at level 12, and go straight into that, and it'll be a challenge for me, but maybe I'll be able to do it. Let's say I'm new to the JRPG formula and I want to spend some more time grinding my characters and levelling them up in areas. This is kind of similar to Pokemon. You can really spend your time and then make those boss fights easier as your characters are more powered up. It's good in the sense of people that want a challenge can get it. They can run straight into a boss fight. However, people that want to have a little bit more of an easy time with it and spend a little bit more time grinding, they can do too. Again, another way that Square has really crafted this game to fit a massive target audience and appeal to as many people as possible. When you say that, you might think that the game might be more diluted for certain players or they're really focusing on one target audience and trying to appeal to everybody, but the game feels full and entertaining for whoever's playing it. And that's the reason why I think I really enjoyed it, because you can really enjoy this game. It's easy to like because it, is, it appeals to so many different target audiences. If you're a retro gamer, play the 2D mode. If you're a younger player, you might want to spend a little bit more time grinding so the game isn't as hard for you. If you're a serious JRPG person, you might want to just skip the grinding and run straight into the, the boss fights. Or if you prefer action in this game, you can even skip every single cutscene. I don't recommend this, because the game is just great and that's the main part of the game in my opinion, but if you don't want to see the cutscenes, you can skip them. It's there. Again, perfectly showcasing how Square have fine-tuned this game to be enjoyed by as many people as possible. Another way that Square have done this is through the skill trees of each character. Each character has a skill tree, and from there you can decide to appoint which skills that you want to put on which skill within the character. For example, if I'm playing as the main hero and I want to use swords instead of knives, I can put all of my skill points which I get for leveling up all on the sword part of that skill tree. However, if I use knives, I could put it all on the knives part. So depending on what, what weapon you use, it's going to depend on how strong your character is in certain areas, which is great that they've done that, because you can really choose how your character acts. So now we're not only going into difficulty in how the game plays, we're now creating our own characters in the way that how are they going to react to certain things, what are their weaknesses, what are their strong points. And like I said before, Square have done this to just appeal to as many people as possible, to really feel like they have a hand in the story and what's going on with each character here. I'll be honest, it's great to see a developer doing this. In the year of 2020, where games can be just put out to make cash grabs and put out as cheaply as possible, it's refreshing and different to see a game with so much care in it that Square have put in here. They don't care about how much money they can make, they don't care how cheap they can make the game. Square genuinely care about making a solid product and selling it to people. And they're even selling it cheaper. I've seen this game on the eShop as low as below £30 which is crazy. Despite all this, what's really sort of changed my opinion about the game, what surprised me the most was, I'm not normally a JRPG guy. I like platformers, I like the occasional shooter game, I like levelling up, I like these really simple games which have a simple story and then you have to do a simple task. I like that sort of thing. So for me to like a game like Dragon Quest with a massive 80 hour story and puzzles and a story to unlock and things, characters to have their own story arcs and weapons and stuff and it's, it's unlike me to like this sort of thing. I don't normally like games like this. I'm not, a, I'm not an RPG guy. I'm not a JRPG guy. 
I occasionally play Pokemon when there's a new one out. I think they're okay, but I would never say I'm an RPG person. I will openly admit, this game has completely changed my opinion on the genre. Gen genre redefining, you could say, for me. I've gone from thinking that JRPGs aren't really that my sort of thing, not really for me, and now loving them because of Dragon Quest. Now, I can't talk about the post-game because I've only just finished the game's story, but after I've finished the post-game, I'm even tempted to go back and buy some of the previous Dragon Quest games. I've bought this game in January of this year, and from there I've become knowing nothing about Dragon Quest to becoming pretty much a Dragon Quest fanatic. I, I, I can't describe how this game has completely changed my opinion on JRPGs. It has completely blown my mind. I urge you, even if you think you're not a JRPG person, if you think, no, that game isn't for me, just try it. See if you like it. My opinion has completely changed. If you used to tell me six months ago you'll be talking about Dragon Quest, I never would have believed you. For the most part, this review has been very, very positive. I've said pretty much all positive things. However, I do have two really sort of small nitpicks of the game but I feel like it should be said because I want to be transparent with you all that but there is a couple of things I didn't really like with the game. First thing being the game's music. I didn't really like the fact that the music was a little bit repetitive. Uh, from a lot of the game that you'll be going around is an open world, sort of semi-open world areas, defeating enemies, grinding, that sort of thing, before you get to the next part that you need to progress to the story. This music alone is fine within itself, it's a fine track to listen to, I have no, there's nothing wrong with the music at all, but my only problem is, it's the only track used in terms of every single time you're battling. It's the same music over and over again, and I know this is common for many RPGs to do this as well, but I feel like some more variety of music could have really helped the game's flow and make the game more interesting here. A minor nitpick, I know, but I found myself watching a YouTube video, listening to a podcast, or listening to an album while I was grinding the game. It's nothing wrong with the music itself, the track that plays is fine, but just gets a little bit repetitive and annoying after maybe an 80 hour long playthrough. That being said, for this Nintendo Switch version, all the music has been updated to be orchestrated, not synthesised like the ones shown on the PlayStation 3DS versions. A strange choice to make, because I'd imagine Square would have had a limited amount of storage they could put on one Switch cartridge, and they'd have to re-record all of this as an orchestra. It seems like they've gone above and beyond, again, but I'm so glad they've done it, it just seems like a weird design choice to make. A good choice, but a weird one. My second minor nitpick with the game is that the game, every time you die, takes away half of the coins you've earned. This can be kind of crushing because one, you don't want to die to begin with, you don't want to lose your lives, you don't want to die, but also, you know, if you're going to die, you're going to have major, major cutbacks in terms of the money that you have within the game. Luckily, you can go to local towns to cash in half of this money and keep it in there, but again, you're going to lose half the money every time you die as well, so it's really hard. Let's say I've bought 10 enemies and I've got one character left that's about to die. All that money that I've used before is now completely wasted. If I was saving up for a weapon, this could be really, really crushing here. And from a gameplay standpoint, apart from extending the game and maybe having more of a post-game collecting weapons, I'm not sure why Square decided to do this. To me, it doesn't really help the game at all. The game's already got an 80 hour long story, why do you potentially want to over expand the game by having it even longer collecting weapons? Speaking of weapons, in the new Nintendo Switch version you can bring out what's called the Fun Sized Forge, a way of crafting your own weapons, and in the Switch version you can bring this out at any time. You can also buy your own materials and in theory there's no real reason to buy the weapons themselves. This is the way I got all of my weapons and that's why I didn't really have issue with my money going. I found most of the materials on my quest anyway, so I didn't really need to buy them, so all I really did was just found the materials I got, crafted new weapons and grinded from there. I didn't really need to buy weapons, I didn't really need to use money, so yes, it is a little bit of a nitpick that the money does half every time you die, but it wasn't really an issue to me. But if you're more of a buying the weapons kind of person, you might want to be aware of this before you play the game. That brings me to my final point. Is this game really for you? And the answer is kind of a weird one, that one. I'm not an RPG person and I still enjoy this game and you know it, you might not be an RPG person yourself but I urge you to try this out. I've already made comparisons to Pokemon in this video but I feel like 
Dragon Quest XI is what Pokemon Sword and Shield should have really been, and if you're a Pokemon fan, I think you'll enjoy this game. What I mean by this is, I feel like Pokemon Sword and Shield and the Pokemon Company could really look at this game and see some of the RPG elements and really expand upon them within the Pokemon franchise. For example, whether that be with visuals or character dialogue or story, just in general, I feel like lots of other companies could really take some inspiration from Square. Yes, the game took Square five, six years to make, but it really paid off in the end. No, I'm not saying we should wait five years for the next Pokemon game, but I feel like there's a lot of elements here that they could really, really use and really take advantage of, just making their games better. But going back to my point of, is this game for you? Well, if it's not for you, or you're slightly interested here, or you might think it's for you, what you can do is you can download a free 10 hour demo on Nintendo eShop. This demo will let you get the first 10 hours into the game, it will set up the story and give you a basic synopsis of what's going on here. You can learn the world, you can meet the characters, you can fully understand what the game is like and then from there you can make a decision if you like it. The game itself is more high budget and longer than some games on the eShop that you have to pay money for. It's a free 10 hour experience, why wouldn't you want to download it? If you don't like it, great, you've not wasted £50 or £30 on the game. But if you do like it, you know you're going to like it when you make the full final purchase. Again, showcasing how Square have really made this game appeal to as many people as possible. They're literally giving this game away for free. They're giving 10 hours away for free to see if you like it, to try and get people interested within this franchise. And if you are interested, all of your data from the demo can go over to the full version whenever you choose to buy it. To sort of conclude this review, I loved Dragon Quest XI. It's one of my favourite games I've ever played on the Nintendo Switch and I think you should try it due to its free demo and really really expansive 10 hour demo too. I've had a blast with this game, the quality of the game is amazing and I feel like more people need to experience this game. I think it's bad that we don't get many Dragon Quest games in the West and I feel like Square should really reevaluate what they're doing with that and translate some more previous Dragon Quest games to come over to the West as well as all future games to come over to the West too. Top and bottom line, I love this game and we need more Dragon Quest in the West. So that was my thoughts on Dragon Quest XI. I feel like this is probably the definitive edition to play on Nintendo Switch with the extra features and all the content, portability, everything to do with it. Really is the best version. You're going to play this game, play it on Switch. It's got the most content out there. It is still great on PC and PS4, I've been told. I wouldn't know I haven't played those versions, but for the Switch version, it is pretty much perfect in my opinion. Some minor nitpicks here or there, but it really doesn't really take away from the game itself. Um, if, you, if you feel like checking it out, it is free on the eShop, the 10 hour demo is on the eShop, and then you can get the full version, which I do recommend doing before you buy it, it's what I did, and overall I really did enjoy it. Next month's episode of Owen Thoughts On is Splatoon, and uh, I hope you'll check that out, that should be out around mid-May, and uh, we hope you've enjoyed this content. We'll uh, hopefully do some more reviews, more episodes of Owen Thoughts On, and uh, we'll see you later. So thank you so much for watching, take care.